Hello, and thank you for joining today's Port of Los Angeles News Briefing. I'm Philip Sanfield, the Port's Media Director. Joining me, as always, is Port of Los Angeles Executive Director, Gene Soroka. In just a minute, we'll share our March and first quarter cargo volume, along with insights as to what's driving the surging numbers. But before we do that, Gene, why don't you tell us about today's special guests? Happy to, Philip, and welcome, everyone. Our guest today will be Willie Adams, International President, and Frank Ponce de Leon, Coast Committeeman of the ILW's International Longshore and Warehouse Union. I hosted a wide-ranging interview with them here on the LA waterfront last week. After the operational update, we'll share that conversation. All right, Gene, let's start off with cargo. Last March, the Port of Los Angeles processed a record 958,000 TEUs. You noted at our last briefing that would be difficult to match. So how did we do? Philip, I did say it would be difficult. Yet thanks to the exceptional work of so many, we've set yet another monthly record. Overall volume reached more than 958,000 20-foot equivalent units, just edging out the record we set last March. And this turns out to be the third best month overall in the port's history, behind only 1 million TEUs that we did last May and 980,000 TEUs in October of 2020. We have started off year 2022 with three consecutive record months and our best first quarter ever, eclipsing the previous record set just last year by three and a half percent. Yet we're not taking any of this for granted. Our supply chain partners are committed to going all out, planning and pulling together to keep up this great work. Gene, give us a quick rundown of imports, exports, and empties for March. And would you also take us through what's driving this latest cargo surge? Sure, Philip. Let's start with the data. No surprises here. Imports remain strong at about 495,000 TEUs as our retailers continue to replenish inventory and satisfy demands of the American consumer. On the export side, we handled nearly 112,000 TEUs in March, down 9% year over year. Exports have now declined 37 of the last 41 months here in Los Angeles. With import activity strong and exports waning, empties are being processed at greater levels than ever back to Asia. In March, we moved 351,000 empty TEUs. That's up 2% year on year. Now, here's what I think is behind our strong Q1 start. First, better fluidity on our docks. We've been working at this for a long time, and it's paying off with fewer vessels waiting in the queue and more velocity on the terminals. Second, we've got more workers on the docks with fewer shifts getting cut. That's because we're past Omicron, and we also have a lot more room to maneuver on our terminal tarmacs. And third, we're using data more than ever to see around corners and over hills to address issues before they become problems. As a result of these analytics, we're now putting an all-out focus on rail. Rail volume has increased sixfold in the last month alone. Today, there are about 16,000 containers waiting to load on dock rail, almost double from last fall. So you can see the order of magnitude right now. We're working diligently with C-suite partners and the administration in Washington to reposition rail cars and get containers into the U.S. interior. So bottom line, an outstanding quarter one, our best ever. The cargo keeps coming and the work is ongoing to improve fluidity. Still, as they say in the financial fine print, past performance does not guarantee future results. We'll keep working hard at this every day. Thank you, Gene. Please remember after the upcoming interview, Gene will be available to answer questions. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and please include your name and affiliation. Gene, now what we've all been waiting for, the interview with the ILW officers, over to you. Philip, it was so great to sit down with Willie Adams and Frank Ponce de Leon to hear their thoughts on our industry and bring their perspectives to this forum. They flew down from San Francisco last Thursday just to do this. I'm really grateful to both gentlemen and pleased to share this interview with you now. 
I'm on the LA waterfront with Willie Adams and Frank Ponce de Leon of the ILWU. Gentlemen, great to see you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Gene. Nice to see you as well. Willie, for those watching today who don't know a lot about the union, tell us a little bit about the ILWU and your proud history. Well, our proud history, we were formed Aberdeen, Washington, 1937. I would say best, the IOW is an enigma. We're dock workers, we're hotel workers, we're ferry workers. We even have bookstore workers, uh, people that work in the canneries. I mean, we're just a mixture of America's workers. Fantastic. Last year, this Port of Los Angeles moved a record 10.7 million TEUs. And I know from our side, we're extremely proud. Tell me a little bit about the perspective of the men and women that are out there on the docks every day and what it means to them. What it means, they are true American heroes. They've been doing this for over 80 years. I think worse for their years was it was said by the pundits that we weren't going to have a Christmas. That is a far memory now. And today, I can honestly say with Coast Commitment Frank, if somebody deserved Time Magazine's Person of the Year, it is the dock workers, the men and women of the mighty ILWU. Frank, over the last couple of years, the behind the scenes stories are just as important. We see all the numbers and the recognition and the pride, but it's been a tough two years behind this pandemic. What about the rank and file and what they did? They went out there on the job every day down in here. They've been averaging six days a week, selfless work, then having to go home to their families and protect them, the illnesses, the sickness. Tell us a little bit about that perspective. Well, Gene, as you know, I mean, we worked uh, directly with the port and trying to uh, secure PPE and cleaning and other supplies. But uh, uh, for the last two years, the, this period of COVID has been hard and painful, um, painful to the uh, to the effect that people didn't take notice on the ports until we had over 24 people die within 40 days. And then everybody started worrying on what was going on. Our people never stopped showing up and going to work. We kept the ports open. We kept uh, the cargo moving. And uh, we made sure that uh, our, um, our, our stores and our hospitals and the PPE and uh, to the medical people got the supplies that they needed. And uh, uh, we implemented a, a lot of change in policies uh, up and down the West Coast. And that, that was hard because it was a change in, in some of our operations for our, our guys. And, um, and we did it because we needed to keep them safe. Uh, but it has been a struggle and it uh, looks like we're heading out of it. Uh, but uh, time will tell. We all owe you a deep debt of gratitude. It was that it was that same work ethic that carried us through the darkest times when we didn't know where the American economy was going to go. And then the bounce back that was so sharp and everybody was out there moving that cargo in and out. And Willie, it's no coincidence. We've been working on a lot of issues with the Biden-Harris administration, Governor Newsom here in California and his staff moving out this record cargo. Even as you say, back in the fourth quarter, we helped the American retailers really have a record year. Tell us a little bit about the work that you guys have been doing with both the federal administration and here in the state. Well, we've been working with uh, President Biden, uh, Secretary Buttigieg, Secretary Walsh, and then you know yourself, the infrastructure bill passed. It was bipartisan support. What we do in maritime is bipartisan. And we want to make sure that our ports are functioning at 100 percent. But also, too, we had our grandparents infrastructure and we're putting the investment in there for good working class jobs for our communities, because at the end of the day, the IOW, we're on the side of the American people and the economy. And it sure was something else, Willie. Back on October 13th, when you and I had the privilege of meeting with President Biden, Secretary Buttigieg, NEC Director Brian Deese, along with John Picari and Mario Cordero. Tell the folks a little bit about that day in the Roosevelt Room. It was really historical to really uh, be said in there that the IOW was invited to the party. We had a voice at the table and the president actually listened. And his commitment is to ports. Never before have we had a president that says, ports is a priority to me. And he says, I'm going to back it up. And he put John Picari on, he was in Oakland. He sent Secretary Walsh, Secretary Buttigieg out here. And they put $14 billion into infrastructure. And when you really think about that, we haven't had a president do that. And so he's made a commitment like no other. 
And then on top of that, Governor Newsom came in with over $2 billion, the first time ever that a state, especially in California, this is the fifth largest economy in the world. And Gene, you know, I've said it before, we have the Speaker of the House, we have the Minority Leader, uh, we have the Vice President of the United States, we have one of the leading sen senior Democrats, and we have the Governor. How is it that we don't have the infrastructure and be leading the world? Because where California goes, the nation follows. You're right. We account for 40 percent of the nation's imports, 30 percent of the exports. And it's been all that hard work over the last year and a half of trying to align policy with the workforce, the ports, the private sector supply chain as well. And we're starting to see it come together for the first time in a generation with the federal, state and local governments aligned with these other important partners. You say it so well. Frank, at the same time, you've been on all these calls with us, with the White House and the National Economic Council, Department of Transportation, and private industry. Tell the audience a little bit about your experience in these calls and how it's made a difference in moving all this cargo. Well, Gene, as you as you know, we there's a quite a uh, there's a big number of people that are on those calls, maybe 50, 60. It's been interesting as a, from a different perspective on what transpires on the business side. And, which, and, and how it affects labor. We are the strongest link. And um, we, we sit on those meetings and some of that, uh, the uh, initiative is of 24 seven. As you know, our ports and our contracts have called for 24 seven all the time. So, I mean, back that I was registered in 1982 and we've always had the ability to work 24 hours a day. And it takes our employers to order us and, and we go to them, we fill those jobs and go to work. Um, each and every day, but can you imagine what would happen if everybody else in the supply chain worked 24 seven? And I think that's why the message from the uh, Biden administration was to um, go to work 24 seven. It wasn't pointed at the ILWU. Um, surely they, they know that we have that in our contracts as well, but it was a measuring stick for everybody else to keep up. You know, everybody else doesn't pick up the pace as well. And uh, we're there to answer the bell. We've always have been. And we've always been on the side of, uh, of the, the uh, of people in America and in this country. And we never left our post, never. This is a delicate situation because these uh, meetings are ran by under FMC guidelines. It's been very interesting, very, very interesting. Yeah, so well put. And we couldn't do it without both you guys. I mean, going to Washington and campaigning and trying to make sure that our policymakers, elected officials understand what's happening on the ground and through the broader economy on these calls that we've been having daily and several times a week with the White House and others back in Washington. Um, you know, your participation, Frank, has been essential to really getting that message out there and having folks understand what happens here and what needs to happen next. Just like back on October 13th, when Willie, you and I were in Washington, the announcement of the port going 24 seven was not a stretch for us. We work 19 hours a day today, primarily, trying to fill that hoot shift was the task at hand, but it was about getting the private sector to come along on the same schedule, whether it's the truckers, the warehouses, the employers, and so many others, right? Right, John Bakari said it best, our third shift goes unutilized. You know, and, and there's a reason that goes unutilized because we're, we're, not, we're not there. I mean, we're not being ordered to go to work. And the reasons why is because we don't have chassis. We don't have gondolas. We don't have the movement of the car, of, of, of the goods that we need to have on that hood ship. But in order for us to, to, to move better, and he said it best, we have got to be able to utilize that structure that we have in place now and tomorrow. We're capable of much more as an industry. And that's, I think, what the ILW has been trying to exemplify through all these discussions and all this travel, correct? Going on 85, 90 years, we've always kept moving the bar moving it down the field. And as Frank was saying in, in the White House, right, the president was challenging everybody to put some skin in the game. We do it. Our members have risked life and limb every day, 40 some deaths, uh, mental illness, and things like this to put the American people first above their own safety, above their own lives. They don't need recognition. They don't need any medals. They're proud, patriotic Americans. So well put. And, you know, we see this every day, Willie, but I'm glad the audience today and those who will be viewing this discussion get a chance to hear those words as well. So very important for America and the world to know what you just said. As we go to the next steps, you got more cargo coming in. 
than ever before, right? Best first quarter in the ports history here in LA. And that's just a microcosm of the 29 ports that you guys oversee every single day and the membership that you represent. Second quarter is said to be another good one on the way with retailers and others bringing in more cargo, but we've got to get the American exporter going too. And I know that's been part of the conversation. Everybody should be invited to this. I agree, Gene, and you know, that's been our position. We took a position for uh, those people, uh, the ag folks, and uh, uh, that uh, they were being prevented from shipping um, their exports out. And uh, we thought that, hey, there's got to be some uh, commitment on the carriers and even on our on our companies to, to help these people out. And you know, but they, people who make commitments need to follow up on those commitments. Now, with all this cargo coming in and the nonstop work that we've seen, whether you're an administrator like me or the men and women out on these docks, everybody's going all out. But training is a big issue. So the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach have been long talking with the ILWU and many others in the industry about building a training center. And even in the United States, this will be the first goods movement training campus in our nation. The ILW is going to be an important partner in this, from development to planning, all the way through to bringing men and women to get trained here. The governor has announced a budget line item of $110 million, first of its kind, to be matched with our 20 acres of land here in LA and $40 million worth of investment. Give us the ILW perspective on a project of this magnitude. Sure. I mean, I think the uh, first point is that uh... Um, you know, we've got to thank the governor and we've got to thank you, Gene. I mean, you guys have dedicated uh, the, the, the land and, and the, the, the money. And I'm glad to finally see that the, the people are stepping up and recognizing that, hey, look, at if we don't train for the future, there's not going to be a future. I am glad that you and your leadership at the port um, have stepped up to, to, to push for the training center. Uh, you know, the ILWU is going to be involved in it. And I'm going to challenge PMA. They need to be fully invested. In, in, in developing uh, this, such the training programs, not only for our longshore, not for our mechanics, but for our clerks and foremen as well. Whatever we need, we need to get that through, through that site. And if this is a role that we can play to help expedite or accelerate the training on the ground, hey, we don't have all the answers, but we do know the right people to talk to and the right way to set things up. Gene, yeah. just real quickly on that, the younger generation needs to know that we're committed to them. And this training center is for the younger generations to upgrade their skills going into the future. They need to know as proud Americans that they can get a job down here on this waterfront and have the skills, right? They, they, they need to know that and that we're committed to them and that we're leaving something behind to them that's tangible, right? Not just a lot of talk. And, and yes, and the PMA has to step up and they have been missing in action. And like I said, Gene, you've been committed. The White House has been committed. The state has been committed. But the PMA, they've, they've been missing. And, and you know what? They have to step up and they got to engage. We're their workforce. And you can't say that you're committed and use a lot of lingo and then you're missing in action. You know, and we've said this for a long time that how do you get people trained when you got all this cargo moving through and everybody's going all out, right? We don't have downtime for machines to get folks in there. And when we do have that little bit of downtime, we got to work on these machines. Maintenance and repair is key to making sure that this equipment is safe and secure for the next man or woman who gets into it. But the hard work lies in front of us and we got to keep rolling up our sleeves. Willie, over the last couple of years, the media has been out covering our industry from Asia to the U.S. and back. We've seen news helicopters flying over the port, counting ships. You and I have been in a number of meetings together out in public, and you've said that normally nobody follows our industry until it's contract season. That's changed a little bit now, but we've seen a lot of folks writing articles and covering about what's coming up in the negotiations. From your perspective, give the viewers out there the take of the international president coming up on the contract negotiations. First of all, normally you would hear, say, ex-president, President Obama or other presidents in a State of the Union address, they might only mention ports twice or when we were in negotiations, ports would be mentioned. But like right now, nobody's talking about 300 ships sitting in Shanghai. Nobody's talking about the 200 ships in Hong Kong or the 150 ships in Singapore. We're talking about worldwide trade. There's supposed to be ships out there, right? We're talking about a gold rush that is happening. Nobody's talking about all the money 
that these foreign companies have made. Everybody ought to just tone it down and stop all the rhetoric. We have been negotiating the IOW and our employers since the 1930s. There's adults on both sides of the table. It's called the process. And you yourself, Gene, you was there. And the president said it across the table. I believe in the American process of collective bargaining. That's a right as an American. People died for to have that as an American, the process, right? When we say liberty and justice for all, that's what we live under, right? And we will get an agreement. And it, it takes both sides. And, and right now, we're, we're, we're getting ready. The other side, they're doing what they have to do. But sometime in May, we're going to sit down. We're going to get an agreement. And I wish instead of people writing things and saying that you're going to throw the baby out with the bath water, or this or that's going to happen. They ought to be talking about the positive things out of COVID, all the good things that have come out of this. So much as focus has happened on ports, on infrastructure. We're talking about training. We're talking about so many good things that's going to benefit Americans, American workers, right? And we were there, right, when the president signed his infrastructure bill. Isn't this what we want to leave it a better for the next generation? But at the end of the day, we've been doing this over 85 years and we will sit down. We will get an agreement just like Major League Baseball, the NFL, anything else. They go and you go back and forth. This is a part of being a proud American. Some countries, you don't have a collective bargaining agreement. We have that. And I am proud of that and, and, and our union, right? Just like the calls, and I want to thank Frank for the calls that he's been on, right? To, to say how we can improve things. And for so long, Frank has been beating the drums about if you think about doing this, you think about doing, it can be better. Finally, people are starting to listen. Who knows more about shipping and a lot of things? Now, all we offer is our labor. We don't make business decisions, but we are the best workforce on this planet, bar none, the men and women of the IOW, and, and we do it right. We were all so heartened near the beginning of COVID when nobody knew what was going to happen, that the ILW leadership sat down with the Employers Association and others, including the ports, to work on health and safety measures, to make sure that we had the best PPE, as Frank said, getting out there, that we were cleaning machines and communication devices. These talks are ongoing. This is work that happens every day. And isn't that why it's called labor relations? Because that's the interaction that's got to take place. So, Willie, you pointed out very, very well. Frank, your thoughts? Well, that's a testament to, um, you know, our collective bargaining agreement. I mean, if people just look what, what we've done over the last past two years, we sat down and collectively bargained agreements to get through COVID. But we sat down and bargained an agreement to keep moving, to keep people safe, to make sure our ports were open. We, we didn't close any of our ports up and down the, uh, the whole West Coast. Other people in the nation were, and other people across, across the ponds in other countries were. But not this, not this West Coast. We just need to continue to uh, look at the cargo that we're, that's what we're faced with and move it and make sure people get their products. That's it. It's simple. And I know, and I'd, I'd like the audience to hear this today. As we go through these negotiations, I've said publicly, Willie, and shared with you and Frank both, you got seasoned professionals at this negotiating table. These folks know what to do. You guys know what to do. The rank and file is going to be out on the job moving this cargo. As Frank says, that caravan's continuing to come over. And I'm sure we can count on the ILW rank and file men and women to keep doing the stellar job they're doing all throughout this surge of cargo coming to the U.S. And yes, they will. They're proud Americans. They take pride in their job. You look at Frank, there's generations, you know, the Ponce de Leon, the Oliveras, there's just generations and they have pride and they're carrying the name of their ancestors that came before that built this waterfront. And we continue to, to carry that, right? And it takes a collaboration and we will get there. It's like a marriage, right? There's bumps, there's up and downs, but you got to enjoy the ride, right? But you can't say if it was that bad, we wouldn't be setting records and billions and billions of dollars have been made, right? We, we're looking at a new infrastructure like something since Woodrow Wilson. I mean, this is no other country like this. And, and, and as I said, we will get an agreement. And 
I, I, I'm enjoying this. As I said, my blood pressure right now is 106 over 68. And I know Frank's is too. And, and it's, a, it's an honor. You're right, guys. And I, I see that every day around town, whether it's at lunch or the grocery store. Last night, I ran into a couple of families from the ILWU. And, and you're exactly right. They take great pride in what they're doing. And these are folks I've known for a long time. But the work's ahead of us, the work's to be done, and it's that great work ethic that continues to shine through. Guys, we're coming to the end of time. I wish we could talk even longer, but Willie, is there any other message you'd like to leave with the audience today? Just that to our members of the IOW, just how proud we are of them, right? That they just make you the, the proudest person on, walking on the face of the earth, right? Their commitment to American values, their commitment to to hard work and their commitment to keep that flag and that flag is never has never has never touched the ground and that uh i woke up this morning and i know moving forward that every day will be a brighter day frank your final thoughts uh gina first of all i'd be remiss i want to thank you very much for inviting us uh um to talk with you today and then for your for the program i want to make sure it's important that the american people know that we're on their side we, we're on their side. We're American. We're workers. And all, you know, we, we want to continue to do the things that we do. Um, and it's important to know that uh, that uh, we're doing that the ports are publicly owned ports and we're operating on, on, on the best domestic use of our of our lands uh, for our communities. And that's important. And it's finally uh, it's taken a pandemic for other people to realize that that's a critical port, a part in the development and the, and, and the future moving forward. So. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's rewarding. And, and again, uh, um, I want to thank all those people who have recognized our work over the last two years. Uh, that's important. Uh, the, the people have, have thanked us. I want to thank them publicly. Um, and for all the people out there, you know who you are, uh, but for, for you, you yourself and the, and the port complex, Gina, uh, thank you very much for everything you've done for us. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. And Willie, Frank, on behalf of the city and the Port of Los Angeles, thank you both. The work that you do for this port complex, the 29 across the West Coast, and this great United States economy deserves that thanks every day. Gentlemen, it's been a privilege, and thank you so much for coming down here today to spend some time with us. Thank you. Eugene, appreciate it. I think we all just got a sense of the work ethic and deep pride of the ILWU. The backbone of this port has been and always will be the women and men of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. Thanks again to Willie and Frank for those great insights. Gene, let's take some questions from the media. Several have come in already. And if you'd like to ask one, please submit at the Q in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. First question is from Karen Meeks of Pacific Maritime Magazine. There's a lot of concern among shippers about how the upcoming contract talks could affect an already strained supply chain. What's the port doing to facilitate smooth negotiations between the two parties? And how involved will the White House be in helping ensure that the talks go well? Thanks for joining today, Karen. And as you can see from the interview just now, we stay close to both sides, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, as well as the PMA. We work with these folks day in and day out. I think both sides understand how vital they are to this U.S. economy and that this contract, like others in the past, is very important to work through the issues and get out the other side while the rank and file continues to move the cargo. We're only a phone call or a text away at a moment's notice if either side needs us. The White House, the administration, as Willie had said in that interview, starting with President Biden when we met with him, as well as cabinet members and others throughout the administration are keeping a close eye, but they respect the National Labor Relations Act and the CBA that both sides have in place for many, many decades. We'll continue to watch this as many others will. We'll be available as needed, but trust the process, as Willie had said, and though the experts will be on both sides of the table to hammer out a deal. Thanks, Karen. Next question comes from Vanessa Yurkovich at CNN.com. Hundreds of cargo ships are sitting at ports in China, which is under lockdown. They're heading this way. What steps is the port taking to mitigate a traffic jam? Hi, Vanessa. 
Good to have you join us today. Uh, as was talked about over a month ago with potential closures, closures in South China, Guangdong province, the city of Shenzhen and others made it through there. And I'll say the same as I did when those announcements came out. There will be more than likely short term lulls in cargo flow, followed by a pretty quick bounce back of catching up on purchase orders by the manufacturing sector in China. I don't see this getting out of control at this point. The cargo flow, as you've just seen now, nearly 958,000 TEUs came through this port in the month of March with barely a ripple effect, not a lot of noise. Cargo moved out. The 30-day rolling number on cargo output from the port into the interior of the United States continues to be at elevated levels. As I mentioned, we've got to watch this rail product. The over nine days is, is going up again, and we've got to keep our productivity land side high, getting the trucks and trains loaded so they can move the cargo into the economy. We'll be watching this closely, but it's not just watching and reading news clippings. I keep up with friends that I worked with overseas in China during my time there. I'm also watching a lot of other key numbers that are coming out, such as energy usage, traffic patterns, and even pollution to see what level of productivity we're getting in certain sectors and that manufacturing group that I mentioned as well. So we're not going to see an absolute stoppage of commerce. But again, we've got to watch this closely. We've got 40 ships, 43 ships on the way just departing Asia, not yet docked here at the ports in Southern California. That number looks really good. When we think about the fact that we've got 30 traditional services that call here weekly, new entrance to the trade, and still one-way charter hires from our big American importers. The cargo density on the docks is not bad, although it's creeped up over the last month. We're at 65,000 import units on the ground. We're still holding our own with that fresh cargo moving out. We've got to keep our eye on that long dwelling container as well. Thanks for joining, Vanessa. Next question is from Dan Ronan at Transport Topics. Gene, you, sent, you set a first quarter record for cargo, and all indications are that will remain strong through the rest of the year. But with the numbers of, of lar the number of large inbound cargo ships waiting in China, can you sustain the volume? Yeah, I, I think we can, Dan, and thanks for joining. Uh, what I've mentioned was we've got to hit the mark twice. First was an early Lunar New Year where factories closed down so employees could go back and see family and friends the first week of February. We've handled predominantly strong flows of cargo during that time with landings that began in the middle of February towards the end of the month. Some folks thought that our ships on the way over in the queuing system would bounce back over 100. That never happened. The second mark that we've got to hit is quarter two, which is traditionally our slack season. And that's where the retailers, home improvement stores, and others are focused on replenishing inventory. You may remember inventory sales ratios throughout the country were at a decade low following the holidays last year. So folks are making a concerted effort not only to keep up with our demand, but having that good safety stock across their omni-channel levels of distribution. The cargo flow will continue strong into this second quarter. And if we do it right, hit the mark, we're going to pivot into an earlier than normal peak season. Folks are expecting a little bit longer time to manufacture goods, a little bit longer time in the transit sector, as well as getting products through warehouses that remain at very high utilizations, not only here in Southern California, but across the country. So we're going to keep doing our level best. But there's something, Dan, that happens in the supply chain every day that causes us just a little bit of pause, recalibration, and then we go off to the races again. We'll keep you posted all the way through. Thank you, Gene. The next question is from Jeff Berman of Logistics Management. Gene, how do you view the ongoing inflation situation as it relates to how it could impact port volumes should inflation continue to stay high? Like every other American, it, it's hurtful, whether it's at the grocery store or at the gas pump. No matter what we're buying, inflation is there. And in fact, the numbers just came out this morning for the month of March, inflation 8.5% year over year for that month and trailing just a little bit for the annual rolling 12-month number. It's the highest it's been since uh, the early 80s. Realistically speaking, that may have an impact on consumer buying, but we haven't seen it just yet. 
we continue to maintain $2 trillion in savings accounts here in the United States. We've saved a lot of money through the pandemic, however one went about that, and we're spending money. We've said that imports would taper off just a bit as we started spending more money back in the service sector again, going to ball games, restaurants, and traveling a little bit more than we have had to do in recent months. So there are a lot of variables in this supply chain equation. We'll continue to monitor consumer confidence, retail sales, and other analytics that are so important. But please remember, that the average order cycle process of an American importer can run anywhere from 60 to 120 days. Those orders are at the factories. Those folks are making the goods, getting ready to load containers and bring them across the Trans-Pacific here to our port complex. We'll continue to watch anything and everything. We've never had more data than we have today, but it'll be the continued work of all involved to see where we need to go next. And what I've called for previously, is a national export policy. We knew this heightened level of imports would not last forever for whatever causals and impacts the economy may have seen. But getting the exports rolling again, getting the ag and manufacturing community back in the international game is going to be further key to our economic success. It'll also bring better cost structures. We call them round trip and triangulated economics in the industry. So we're not just one wing, this onslaught of imports and then deadheading or empty repoing equipment back here to the coast and on the Trans-Pacific routes to Asia. This is gonna be an important part of our post COVID economic plan. And we continue to work with the Biden-Harris administration and senior cabinet officials to get this done. We have two more questions in the queue. So if there's any reporters out there with more, please submit them uh, soon in the Q&A box. Um, Bill Mangaluzzo, Journal of Commerce, coming back to the China COVID issue, Gene, have, have we noticed a drop in shipments from Shanghai over the last week or so due to the outbreak? And if so, when are we anticipating a rebound in it, imports to reach the West Coast? Thanks for joining, Bill. And again, we haven't seen a noticeable impact yet. As I described a month ago for South China, we're keeping our eye on what's happening in central China right now. Short-term lull, if there are factory closures and others that impact the supply chain of getting goods to the ports for loading the ships. And with that, a pretty quick recovery. Been keeping up with folks on the ground in, in Shanghai. Those that I lived and worked with while I was there uh, working in my previous capacity. And there are some road closures. There are some folks that are not moving cargo as swiftly as normal, but nothing that is gonna be an absolute drop off a cliff. Yet we're monitoring every day. And the look at what we're gonna have coming up in the next couple of weeks to a month may include a little bit of catch up time, maybe repositioning vessels and service schedules to match up with those containers that need to get caught up on from a product standpoint, loaded and brought over here. But again, like we've seen before with some of these regional and municipal impacts, short term lull, pretty quick pickup, and then we get on a steady course going forward. Thanks for the question, Bill. Thank you, Gene. Next question is from Donna Littlejohn of the Southern California News Group. What's the latest on the import dwell fee? With rail becoming more of an issue, is implementing the fee on long dwelling containers now more of a possibility? As painful as it is, Donna, we may have to implement that fee. What we've seen is that the long dwell containers that we categorized nine days or longer had dropped down to about 88, 8,600 units from a peak back in October of 37,500 units that were aging at that time. Even just the threat of a fee, we've never collected a dollar, drove the decline of aging containers down by 75% at its best mark. And imports had gotten under 50,000 units and they were driven down to about half of what we had been holding of the 95,000 containers back in October as well. Now what we've seen is a six-fold increase in rail volume. Both Western railroads had seen really low numbers for a number of months, and everybody in the industry rallied around them to get more intermodal cargo. 
that cargo is here and we've got to handle it better. We can't just necessarily wait for exports and empty containers to be loaded on rail cars and traditional schedules carrying that equipment back to the West Coast. I do know that Secretary Buttigieg has talked to the CEOs of both the Union Pacific Railroad and the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, and both COOs, the chief operating officers, have told me directly they're more than happy to jump into the fray, assist their day-to-day -day colleagues, and see whatever we can do to move the needle. But as a last-ditch effort, if that fee is necessary to get people motivated, we may just have to use it. I'm also seeing the local truck market and that cargo that goes out to the Inland Empire creeping up as well. We've got to have better data across the board. We've been on this data campaign since 2016, putting the nation's first and still only port community system together. There have been laggards and some obstructionists in this area. We need better data so we can see around those corners and over those hills before issues become problems. We're not using data to weaponize it. We're not selling data, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's these great analytics that folks like Avin Sharma and David Libatique use every single day, along with Damian Young and others here at the Harbor Department, to give me a heads up on what we need to be a pay, pay, pay attention to and challenge the industry with before we start seeing backups. And that's been the beauty of what we've learned over the past two years, using this data, not one competitor versus the other, not sharing what a retailer's competitor will be doing, but making sure that we're on the ground with all the data flows and these insights to stay a step ahead of any areas of concern. And if in the end, the only way people listen is when it hits their, their wallet, we'll save that as a last ditch effort, but we'll continue to use every other tool in our kit to keep this cargo moving. Thanks, Donna. Gene, Colin Campbell, I believe he is with Supply Chain Dive following up. Uh, what about empties? Uh, any, any thoughts on a, on a fee there? Any plans to implement on the empty side? Yeah, that empty dwell fee remains in place if we need it, but we haven't yet. Colin, we were at a peak of 90,000 empty units here on the port's marine terminals, as well as our near dock properties. Now, as you can imagine, when we were all just rushing and hustling cargo out to the interior of the U.S. economy during the fourth quarter ahead of the holiday season, in return, you're going to get a lot of empties that come back. And we sure did up to 90,000. But this morning's report that we gave to the White House and to the other industry leaders showed that we're at about 56,000 empty units right now. And that's a sweet spot. Between 50 and 55,000 units on any snapshot in time during the day or night is a good number. Complemented by exports, that will fully profile our complement of vessel calls that we have going back to Asia. Now, we would like to see more exports utilizing those empty boxes. And that's why we're working with the Dairy Farmers Association, the cotton growers, and more recently, the almond growers here in the state of California to try to take off percentages of those empty units, load them up with exports, get them turned back to the port fast so we can reconnect these ag participants with their customers overseas. A lot more work to do, but I like where we're at right now with empties. Gene, Colin follows up with uh, another question about rail. What's causing the rail issues? Is it the surge in volumes at the ports, lack of equipment, rail service outside the port overall, or a combination of factors? Well, it's a combination, but as you may recall, we had nearly 50 trains sitting outside of Joliet, Illinois in the third quarter last year. The two Western railroads took a look at their service, in some cases pausing rail service out of Southern California to the Midwest and especially Chicago. After that, a lot of importers changed their routings and terminated containers here in Los Angeles, devanned them and put them into the domestic supply chain. That intermodal cargo of the intact ocean box didn't come back until recently. And that's where we've grown the business sixfold at the Western Railroad's request. And we've got to get those assets crews and engine power pre-positioned to handle this increase in cargo. There's a lot of nuance to this and we've got experts on the ground from both companies working around the clock, but we've got to show some results. Going from 8,800 containers dwelling nine days or longer to 20,000 is a real concern in my mind. And that's why we've been working with a laser focus on this 
for the past month to try to find any angle we can to reduce those dwelling containers and make sure we bring certainty back to the rail service. Thanks for the question, Colin, appreciate it. Gene, that concludes our questions today. Uh, we've got a lot happening on the environmental front. Would you like to address that in your closing comments? Thank you, Philip. I'd like to conclude by briefly highlighting the work happening here at the Port of Los Angeles to lead the transition to zero emission equipment and heavy duty trucks. Last June, the Los Angeles Harbor Commission approved an environmental roadmap that led to the Clean Truck Fund, which we implemented on April the 1st. Along with the Port of Long Beach, we put into effect a $10 fee per TEU on loaded trucks entering and exiting port terminals. We expect to generate about $90 million annually from this. These funds will be used exclusively to incentivize the development and deployment of zero emissions trucks and infrastructure. For example, the money will purchase vouchers for ZE trucks and help fund the charging stations that go along with them. This latest program is a vital addition to our ongoing efforts to convert to zero emission cargo equipment by the year 2030 and to ZE trucks by 2035. We're the only port complex in the world investing in a goal this ambitious, and we're determined to get it done. We're also partnering on 16 demonstration projects, testing more than 200 ZE units to help bring the best equipment right here to our market. As part of the initiative with Toyota and a dozen other partners, we're testing 10 hydrogen fuel cell trucks, hydrogen fueling stations, and ZE terminal yard tractors. We're so proud to be at the forefront of this emerging technology. And shortly, the Port of Los Angeles will announce an award for the ZE25 program, zero emissions heavy duty trucks to move cargo within a 25 mile radius of the port. This is the first of its kind in a program to support near-term deployment of ZE drayage trucks for work around the port area. In addition to all of this, California Governor Gavin Newsom has allocated $875 million in his proposed budget for ZE trucks, equipment, and infrastructure. This is a great boost to support our efforts. Even with all that's being done, we need a lot more assistance from public and private sector partners. Transitioning the truck fleet here in Southern California ports that serve this complex will cost north of 10 billion US dollars. That means all stakeholders will need to step up. We need original equipment manufacturers to accelerate development and deployment of ZE trucks that can be commercialized on a larger scale. The more interest there is, the more incentive there will be for manufacturers to invest in the technology. It's important to emphasize at its core, these collective efforts are a bridge to a shared sustainable future for all of us. Thanks for participating today. Philip and I look forward to being with you again next month. Take care, everyone.